welcome to the Baseline Feed Podcast. My name is Tanner Wood, and I'll be your host. This is the first episode of our season, and I must thank you all for your incredible support during our first season. We've worked hard in the last months to prepare the second season, and on behalf of the Baseline Feed team, we hope you enjoy it. As you know, Baseline Feed is a podcast to serve aspiring authors and voice talent, even producers. To inquire about it, send us a quick message at BaselineFeedPod at gmail.com or a voice demo at casting at BaselineFeed.com. Check out our website at BaselineFeed.com for more information. If you enjoy what we're doing here, please feel free to leave us a review and rating or check us out on Patreon. For now, here's our first story of the season. C.M. Peters wrote Liam, based on a personal experience working on a haunted island. Creepy, huh? She is joined by other voice actors, such as newcomer Bailey Wood and Julia Wood, Evan Jaffe, J. Philip Morris, and Katie Tatry. Here is Liam. A new job was usually an exciting thing. A local tourism company was looking for a clerk, and I was ecstatic about it since it was also on a remote island. Working on a small island and telling people about an important part of history appealed to me. The excitement didn't last once I got to the island. I would be a gift shop clerk, but thought I'd make the most of it by taking the experience in. Once on the island, every employee had to know the basics of Quarantine Island in case tourists asked questions. While I waited for a tour of the island to begin, I read aloud to myself some of the paperwork I'd been given. Approximately 30,000 immigrants were quarantined on the island to prevent them from spreading illnesses to the then-called Province of Canada, somewhere around the 1830s. Nearly 7,500 people died from cholera and typhus fever. They were all buried on the island. I dutifully visited the island from A to Z. The disinfection building, commonly known as Building 29, it looked like pictures I'd seen of the World War II gas chambers. The barracks housing for healthy passengers were dull and smelled like a hospital. The churches were lovely, but boring. I enjoyed the visual of the Celtic cross erected in the deceased honor on the island's western edge, especially at sunset. My visiting group finally made it to the hospital. The guide made it a point to showcase the horrors left behind. Here we have the hospital. Even with the mattresses and medical attire removed, you can still get wafts of the original scents. A shiver of disgust went down my spine. The smell was like nothing I'd ever experienced before. It was a mixture of floor wax, turpentine, and death. It didn't matter that the area was clean hundreds of times since the last patients were there. This hospital hasn't been used in over 90 years, yet it still smells like the sick and dying were here yesterday, doesn't it? I walked around with tourists, learning about the Irish immigrants' fate. So many had died from the different illnesses. I ran my fingers along the wooden posts, reading the names of the plaques nailed to the walls. O'Sullivan, Gallagher, Ahern, Brady. The list was never-ending, and it appeared entire families had passed in this building. So sad what happened here. 
It was like I could hear children coughing, adults moaning, and nurses reassuring them the best they could. Yet there was no one. The tour ended with a visit to the cemeteries, plural. One was for the adults, bumpy and creviced, as coffins had been piled one atop the other, only separated by lime. The other cemetery left a taste of bile in my mouth. It was a field of small white crosses, the land filled with the children's bodies. It was a sight I knew that I would never forget. It was eerily quiet, save for the wind. I was in a daze when I finally returned to my post at the gift shop. I worked like a robot, mechanically scanning the tourists' items as they bought souvenirs. They seemed so joyous to have visited and discovered the Jack, island of death. All I could think about were the names I'd seen putting faces on those long-forgotten people. One fateful day during the breakfast meeting, my co-worker Clara told me about Liam. Young Liam McGuire crossed the Atlantic with his family. They barely survived the cholera epidemic brought over with the ship. The Great Famine claimed many Irish immigrants. And it eventually took Liam's siblings and parents shortly after they landed. What became of him? The boy was orphaned at only five years old and had no one in the world. The island's doctor and his wife thought he was nice and decided to adopt him since they couldn't have kids. They wanted to bring him back to the mainland when winter came. So what happened? He didn't make it. Poor kid never had a second chance at life. Cholera caught up to him, and he joined his family in death only a few months later. They buried him with his family in a tweed hat that the doctor's wife had sewn for him. The story chilled me to the bone. I pushed my plate away, unable to eat. I felt so sad for the little boy, but there was nothing I could do but send him a loving thought wherever he was. Everyone carried on with what they enjoyed on days off, reading, watching a movie, hiking in the rain, because rain meant no fairies would cross to the island. I chose to stay in my room. It rained all day long, but finally the clouds cleared up and the sun made an appearance before dusk. Clara and Mike knocked on my door, offering a little evening hike. I said yes immediately. I'll change and join you at the light post. That was our usual meeting point in the morning. I switched clothes and found my frontal flashlight. It could get dark on the island, not a lot of lighting along the paths. Night came and we left in a hurry. We had to wait until it was dark because then we could go anywhere, even where we weren't supposed to. Management told us that many houses weren't safe. The floors were rotting and the walls could crumble at any moment. We didn't care and went anyway. We idly chatted as we made our way. Clara wanted to go to the Protestant church. I want to sing there. The acoustics in older churches are amazing. We got there and she sang His Eyes on the Sparrow. It all gave us chills. We headed back down the cliff to the doctor's house afterward. The house hadn't been renovated, so it was off-limits to tourists. It wasn't off-limits to us. Oh, what a bad idea. I knew something was off as soon as we climbed the creaky porch stairs. The breeze suddenly turned cold and the birds perched on the roof quieted down. I wanted to leave right then and there, but didn't want to pass off like a wuss. So I pushed inside. The scent inside the house was horrible. Rotting wood, rat carcasses, and invading vegetation mixed together. The smell combined with what I'd felt a few minutes before should have been enough for me to leave, but no. Mike proposed we separate. We each pick a room from a hat and explore. We'll meet back outside in half an hour. I didn't want to separate, but I did anyway. I pulled out Liam's bedroom from the hat, so I carefully made my way upstairs. The stairs were rotting and creaking with each step. Parts of the plaster from the walls seemed waiting to fall off interminately. 
Mike, Clara, and the others scattered around the house. Each person yelled out discoveries from the room they had picked. I got a whiskey bottle! I might have found a cookbook over here! Looks like they had a personal chef! Liam's bedroom was at the end of the hall. The door seemed to be locked. I jiggled the knob and finally managed to get inside. The room was dark. The curtains were pulled shut. I surveyed my surroundings with the flashlight, seeing nothing amiss. It was a simple boy's bedroom. A twin bed sat in one corner, a few shelves stood bare with dust piling up, and an abandoned wooden trunk garnished the room. Curious, I went to the closet door. Found it strange that it was closed as all other closets and cupboards were open. Expecting it to be stuck, I pulled the handle hard. Too hard. Bad idea. I fell back on my ass as the door swung wide open. Son of a bitch! Stupid old house! The simple sight froze me on the spot. All of Liam's clothes were still there, neatly folded or hung. A faded plush bear sat on a built-in shelf and a small wooden train beside it. The doctor and his wife loved the boy like he was their own. I went into the closet and my fingertips grazed the bear, then the dusty train. I'm so sorry, Liam. Why are you sorry, ma'am? The words sent a cold shiver down my spine. I narrowed my eyes. Over the last few days, I learned that one of my colleagues, Nathan, loved to do impressions. Shut up, Nate! It's not funny! Then I remembered something else. Nate wasn't working this weekend and took the last ferry to the mainland the night before. I turned around slowly, my mouth agape. My light bathed the room and I came face to face with Liam. He was staring at me with sunken eyes, his tweed hat crooked on his head. He wavered and floated closer to me, his arm raised. Hello, man. My name is Liam. What's yours? The voice was disembodied but still one of a child. His skin had shrunk and some of it was peeling. Many cholera victims had suffered the same fate. I couldn't move as he approached. I felt like my feet were stuck in mud. I'm... I'm... I'm Charlie. What do you want, Liam? I want to play. Will you play with me? I couldn't help but nod even if all I wanted was to get out of there. I was mesmerized by the apparition and watched him fetch his little train. He tried to pick it up off the shelf, but he was too short. Can you help me, ma'am? I'm sorry, Liam, I can't. I have to go now. He frowned and suddenly it felt like all the air had been sucked out from the room. His sweet yet emaciated face turned from joyous to angry. He looked like he was taking a breath and screamed. I tried to run, but the door slammed in my face and I pressed my back against the wall, watching the boy come up to me while I heaved. Liam wasn't corporeal. He was like a mass of wet air, ice cold and gelatinous. He crawled up my legs and clung to me. His small hands played on my cheek. Play with me! I push him and scream. I almost ripped off the doorknob from opening the door, and this time I ran down the stairs. I missed a few steps, hearing some of the floorboards breaking. Once outside, I jumped off the porch, hunching over to try and breathe. My colleagues swiftly joined me, asking if I was okay. I nodded, panting, then looked up. My heart dropped. Liam had managed to push the curtains aside and was staring at me through the window. Do you... do you see him? See what? Liam, at the window. He was there. Come on, it's just a story passed down through generations. It's probably not true. You don't understand. He talked to me. Asked me to play. He had the same hat you described, Clara. I made that up. You're just trying to get attention. I glanced up to the window again. Liam waved at me, smiling. I turned around and walked with the others back to my room for the night. I didn't sleep my thoughts spinning a thousand miles an hour. The next day it rained again, so no ferry crossed. 
I stayed in my cell, reading to distract myself. My friends came over once again to invite me to explore Building 29. I said yes reluctantly. Claire nudged me as we walked there. What's the matter with you? You seem weird. Is it because we teased you last night? Nah, I just had a weird experience in the house. Left me kind of... Honestly, you look half dead. You think? With that story and what I told you I saw, I barely slept last night. I'm sorry. We do that with all the newbies. It's like a rite of passage. Right. I'll sleep in when I go home next weekend. We put on our frontal flashlights and walked in one at a time when we reached Building 29. As usual, we separated. I went to the central block that was flanked by two wings with three annexes in the rear. There was a lot to explore there, but I found nothing as I looked through every nook and cranny. I headed back to the middle where the old showers used to be. I noticed there was water on the concrete floor beneath the metal grills. Hey, Clara? What? Was the water used here in the last few days? No, why? A puff of cold air came from a few steps beneath the floor and I leaned over the brick wall. Liam was there, floating above the grids. Hello, ma'am. Liam's crooked smile almost made him look cute. That was if he didn't have a piece of skin hanging off his cheek. Play with me? I ignored him. It turned cold in Building 29. The boilers weren't working. There was no electricity going to the disinfecting showers. Water began pouring. The hot water produced steam, yet it was freezing in there. How in the hell are those working? Clara, the showers are working! But Clara didn't answer me this time. I turned around to find my friends but came face to face with Liam. He wouldn't let me ignore him this time. Mom, play with Liam! He was angrier, faster than when I met him earlier. Play with me! Ow, fuck! (laughs) He threw his toy train at me. My hand went to my forehead and blood trickled down my fingers. How'd you do that? Doctor and Mrs. Murray said if I put my mind to it, I can do anything, ma'am. I was pulled toward the showers and pushed down against the grate. Blood now poured from my forehead and jaw. Pain coursed through my body. I tried to get up and groaned as I decided another approach. Liam, stop it. I'll play with you. He wavered in front of me and the shower stopped. I sat and so did he. He pushed his train toward me and I moved back with a shaky hand. Are you okay, Liam? Can I help you with something? Just play with me. All right. I inhaled deeply and continued pushing the train. I couldn't hear my colleagues in the other sections, only the water running through the pipes and the steam hissing. I didn't feel as cold anymore, so I relaxed. I wondered what kept Liam here since his whole family had passed, same as the doctor and his wife. Liam, is there something you're looking for? Nope, just someone to play with. I have to go, Liam. My friends are waiting for me. I looked around the room a bit, but didn't even see a flashlight beam. They be gone, ma'am. Long gone. Keep playing with me. No, I have to go now. He hissed and jumped at me, going through me like I wasn't there. I stumbled backward, feeling the cold spreading to my bones, and hit my head on a brick half wall. I saw stars for a second, then Liam's face was hovering over mine contorted with anger. Play with me! I pushed up and decided to fight him with all I had. It wasn't the ghost of a child that would win over me. I glanced around to find a way out, but there was no escape, only showers, boilers, and the one door. It was like he read my mind and blocked that exit. Play with me! He repeated the same words and it echoed enough against the walls to make me dizzy. Let me go, Liam! No, play! 
I was lifted and blasted against a boiler as if the wind had engulfed itself inside the building. Liam, please. Play, play, play. I looked up. A bunch of frayed wires threatened to fall down into the water, electricity crackling in the air. Terror ran through me. Please, don't do this. You'll be my friend forever. The wires fell at my feet and into the water as I heard myself screaming into eternity. How are you with ghosts after this? <laughs> CM Peters will return later this season with a surprising story. By the way, she recently published a new novel entitled Persuasion of Blood. Get your copy now through Amazon. There will be a link to it in the show notes. We close by giving credit where credit is due and highlighting our voice talent. Liam was written by C.M. Peters, featuring Katie Tatry as a tourist. J. Philip Morris as the tour guide. Evan Jaffe as Mike. Julia Wood as Clara. Bailey Wood as Liam. And C.M. Peters as Charlie. The sound design was by Tanner Wood. Episode artwork by Peyton Oden, whom you can find on Instagram at Peyton Coden and music arrangements by C.M. Peters. We would like to express our eternal love and gratitude to our patrons, such as Eric Fones, Ronan Kumore, DJ Night Pterodactyl, Harley Easton, Kurt Wood, and TJ Hodder. You guys help make it possible to bring you quality content and our authors and voice talent more exposure. If you would like our eternal love and gratitude along with other goodies, check us out on Patreon. You can find a link to it on our website at BaselineFeed.com. Thank you for joining us and make sure to tune in every other Saturday on your favorite podcast app to listen to a new episode of Baseline Feed.